Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Shari De Silva. I'm the curator at the Jeffrey Bauer Trust. Today's talk, titled The Making of a Photograph, comes under the programming of our current exhibition on view in Colombo, titled Jeffrey Bauer, It is Essential to Be There. The talk is part of a series where we look at the relationship between architecture and image, drawings and photographs, and idea and experience. In Bauer's own words, getting the picture out and explaining to everyone is difficult. It is for this reason that in the drawings we make, trees and all the landscape elements are included. They are about the total picture, end quote. It is an immense pleasure that we get to have a conversation with Ellen Binet today as part of this program. Although I've known and admired her work for a long time, I first discovered Ellen's work on Bawa in our archives a few years ago, where we have about 20 prints of work done by her for the 2004 exhibition on Bauer at the Deutsche Architecture Museum in Frankfurt, organized by the Trust with David Robson and Amila Demel. I've always been completely mesmerized by these prints and I'm very much looking forward to seeing more from that series today. Ellen Binet is a Swiss and French internationally acclaimed photographer based in London. She studied photography at the Instituto Europeo di Design in Rome, the city in which she spent most of her formative years. Over a period of more than 35 years, Binet has captured both contemporary and historic architecture. She is a fervent advocate of analog photography, working exclusively with film. And she believes that in her words, the soul of photography is an intricate relationship between the instant and the memory. Binet's work has been exhibited in both national and international exhibitions, including a solo exhibition at the Royal Academy of Arts London, which opened in 2021 and just closed, and a solo exhibition at the Power Station of Art Shanghai in 2019. She was made an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects in 2007 and in 2015 was the recipient of the Julius Shulman Institute Excellence in Photography Award. She was also the recipient of the 2019 Ada Louise Huxtable Prize, awarded to a woman who has made a major contribution to architecture and is one of the Royal Photographic Society's 100 heroines. Thank you again for joining us today, Ellen. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Shanika, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you, everybody, to, uh, yes, to attend this uh, meeting on Zoom to be able to talk about um, photography, space, and Jeffrey Bear work. It's, uh, it's really a wonderful invitation. It comes at the right moment to somehow look again at something uh, was for me a very important experience, a turning point also in my career to discover landscape, plants, growing, gardens, and include this in the repertory of my work. So thank you, the Jeffrey Trust Foundation, to invite me and to give this opportunity to go back to this experience. Now, um, before I'm going to present the work, that I've done specifically, um, and I'm going to only talk about the Lunuganga Garden. I'm going to present some of the work that I've done before or after photographing uh, Jeffrey uh, Bauer work that somehow I think were influential in the sense that they prepare me for this experience. They are part of my vocabulary of language of why do I work in such a way and also uh, the influence other work that I've done later on but they also explain uh, and I think this is very much part of the series of talk the complex uh, relationship between the experience of space St. Paul 
image like photography that that wants to relate to this experience and this is what i've been dealing for for 30 years is this very difficult passage where each field has its own identity space architecture and photography sometimes they are quite different so what to do I will uh, start by uh, showing some photograph of a work that I've done very, very early on. Huh? And we are going to see some of the image of a church by Sigrun Leverens. Um, and he's um, a Swedish architect that did beautiful uh, church uh, um, not so far from Stockholm. Why I'm going to present this work is because it was at the beginning of my career and uh, it was clearly there that I started to lay down the foundation of what is going to be for me photographing space and why do I have this passion to photograph space and communicate some of our feeling, dream or idea that we feel when we are in space. Um, as I said before, it's clearly impossible to communicate the experience, the complete experience to be in a building. John Hedrick said we are digested by a building in a sense that when we go in, we can change. There's no other form of art that can change us so much. We can uh, be called, we can... Um, see things we've never seen, we can rest, we can be agitated, we, we, we really, really transform through an experience. Of course, when you go to a space, you also uh, not perceive only with the eye, but you perceive with all your sense. So also reading uh, the work of Palasma, uh, The Skin of the Eye, and Bachelard, I've been a lot influenced and inspired by um, these two uh, great writers about what is space and how we perceive and how we can uh, communicate uh, the feeling of space. But very early on, I was not aware of all of this, let's say, more theoretical aspect, uh, but had this feeling that photography should be, uh, or space should be something very direct, very simple, very reduced, very silent. Aristotle said we can perceive almost sounds better in darkness. In a sense, when you reduce your sense and you say one thing, you perceive it better. So that's why a lots of black and white. Black and white to help us to concentrate on the composition, on the quality of light, on the texture. So this was what immediately struck me when I was asked to photograph this church by Sigrid Leverance for a publication for the Architecture Association, which was the place where Jeffrey Bauer uh, went to uh, learn and study architecture. So his experience of architecture is related to uh, the Architecture Association. Like for myself also, this is where I became to be interested in um, architecture and uh, Photography. I mean, I was already a photographer, finished my study, was trying different things, but this is where I met the real soul of architecture. So what do we do when we photograph? We, we stop this fluid flowing of impressions and phenomenon and things that we see with our eye and our eye move all the time and everything is fluid. We put this fourth segment into the world. Yeah? It's the photography. We stop and with this, we create a composition and uh, we create a dialogue in between the composition, but we do something which is very important. We can displace the image into a book, a wall, or an exhibition, and we create connection, connection, visual connection. And that's the power of photography. If I show you this image, uh, sorry, you see there's a wall, there's a shadow, and then next one, uh, the shadow becomes a tree and you start to doubt and you start to imagine the space. And these are the elements that I think have been guiding me in, in the most, uh, let's say, uh, fruitful way. Uh, that I don't want to tell you everything. There's no way, go to see the place. It's maybe difficult 
to go to Sri Lanka, but let's keep it as a dream that one day you will go and see the Lungurunga garden. What I'm bringing you, it's few experiences, which are very photographic. I'm a photographer. I, I really want to celebrate photography and the quality of photography with something where the most powerful tool is the dream. Because maybe inside the photograph, there's a doubt. It's not all there. And when you start to think, oh, what is it? Then you imagine. And like when you read a book, when you imagine, you make space. We all create beautiful space when we read a book or when we dream. So this is why I wanted to bring this project uh, to the beginning of our conversation to celebrate this moment where I was very young. I was trying. I was asked to photograph this place, but I had this very strong feeling of what should be photography for me to create these little pockets of dream, I call that. It is a very intimate moment that you can grasp and you can be for one second with your imagination in that place. But of course, in this talk, I, I also wanted to present this uh, photograph because nature has such a nice role in this church, which is surrounded by a beautiful forest of all uh, of tree and the tree are almost part of the skin of the building and they echo with the building. So we are already getting ready for this experience of the uh, garden of uh, Lunuganga, which is about mostly about nature. And uh, that was one of the early steps where I started to bring nature into my photograph in relation to building. Next project is something I've done uh, much later, actually quite recently, and uh, I, um, I am keen to show you because it brings some different aspects about architecture and about building. Building a private house, Woodson had finished with a lots of problems, the opera house in Sydney. He was old, not so maybe happy. And he decided to create, make this beautiful house in Mallorca in front of the sea and with local stone and to continue a more solitary life in a place which is really dealing with the element. It's not a place to go to the beach and have a quiet Mediterranean little snooze and jump in the water. It's in the front of a cliff and it's windy and the sea can be rough. And it is about an old man that wants to feel the power of nature and what architecture can do. It's a complex building. Many people have been studying it. It has proportions which are complex. It's, but what I wanted to talk for me, it was more about why this man created this little cave to relate it to nature to feel the nature and how material are fragile because they start to have erosion. They start to have marks due to the water, due to the soil, due to the wind. They are not fixed. They change with time. And this is something that is very, very beautiful in the garden and in the Lunuganga. It's nothing is fixed. You know that the plants are growing while you're sleeping at night almost. You know, you know, next day is going to be different. Nothing has a rigidity. Everything evolves all the time. And that was what came out for me from this experience of photographing a building which is a bit of a cave. Yes, it has a lot of quite inner space to sit and view and feel the outside world. But also, are dealing with the making. So you feel there the presence of the shadows, the trees, the changes. You feel that the stone have been made by a saw, but there are these marks which are actually fragile. They are the one we did, but they're not going to always be there because the real mark are the one of erosion, that the stone is going to change with time because of the wind, the soul, and the rain. So this is why I brought also this uh, building to you before to talk about Lunuganga, but also because for me, it, it's a building that deals with nature, not only the element, but the tree, the vegetation, a beautiful way. It's completely 
embracing the nature and the pine tree are almost part of the architecture. But uh, it brings something out also that uh, I have been fascinating and also reading uh, Bachelard, the poetical space, uh, he talks a lot about vastness, about the need of vastness. Of course, in his analysis, he, he used words because he's a poet and he looks at Baudelaire and he looks at the power of poetry. And I don't have words. I have what I see in the world. The photographer, they steal the, from the world to say something because we are not, I'm, I'm not a painter, I'm not a sculptor. I don't make the thing, but I take them to express some of my concern. And my concern often is where, which place are important place for human beings to understand ourselves, to connect, to understand our role in the world. And there's an incredible feeling often of our fragility. We are, we are fragile and we make these buildings. And I think the building that change with the nature that somehow also might have a little swing with nature, but not resist, is the one that is the closer to us, to our very fragile existence. And this idea of desire to understand vastness is fantastic. And where are we going to find those places? This sense of wanted something immense, but also very full of intimacy, very full of things that are part of our most hidden nature. And I really thought this building was dealing with this dimension that again, we're gonna discover in Jehubawa, the immensity and the intimacy. The last photograph I will show you will express very much this notion. But before to go to the last photograph, I want to talk again about the idea of, um, I don't like to call it illusion, but more ambiguity. Ambiguity is the best word to see that a photograph, it's a construction. It's my eyes, I decide which time, where, how, I make connection. It's not the world. And I prefer to create a moment like this one where you look at the tree and the trunk and you think, is that shadow the trunk of the tree or is that shadow something different? It's that line of the weather, the water dripping down the curve, part of it. So I make a line that doesn't exist in the world, which is the connection to the tree, the shadow and the, the weather stain. And I create a line that could be the trunk, but it's not. And I think your observation kind of swinging between the two, a real moment of being there and detaching almost from the image and start to imagine, no, 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 this is not this, it's maybe something else. And if we are talking about the difficulty of communicating space and architecture with drawings, with painting, with photography, I think that that moment of ambiguity, of freedom for you to enter as you want, not to have anything too prescriptive. Nowadays, we make incredible rendering where everything is so technically wonderful and precise. You look at it for one moment, but you never enter. We have to allow to enter, to create, because we create space all the time. I mean, how many beautiful space we create in our dream? It's incredible, all of us. And this is what I'm trying to reach with my photograph. A little bit of more description, how to say the displays have been very much depicted in the past has a kind of almost Greek temple, looking at the sea, beautiful, but this is not what is for me. For me, it's something much more obscure and delicate. And this last image, one I mentioned before, the, the desire of immensity. We all crave for this. When we look at the star, when we look at the sky, when we look at the horizon, what a powerful thing to live in, in front of an horizon. But we also need intimacy because we cannot be lost in dimension that we barely can uh, grasp. And that photograph with that tiny, tiny stone that my felt 
down every moment because it's almost detached because of the wind and the rain and the soul coming from the, from the sea. That gives us the idea of uh, fragility and intimacy, something very small, very delicate, just suspending time for one second. We're going to move to something that also was photographed very recently, and uh, we're moving also a little bit more uh, to another part of the world, a little bit, a little bit closer to, but further out than uh, Sri Lanka is the work that I've done uh, for a photographic essay on specifically the wall of the Suju Garden in China for an exhibition that I had in 2018. I was asked to present all my architectural photography there at the Palace Station, which is the Museum for Contemporary Art. And they say, oh, it would be really, really nice if you could fit something also Chinese and uh, in the show. And of course, uh, I was delighted. And I was a little bit saying, okay, let's not do contemporary architecture. Let's not do something which has too many of a pagoda roof or something which is very, very hard to give it a new gaze because it's so much seen. Let's go to see this garden. There are gardens which are quite big, full of bonsai, little bridge, with a beautiful building. I'm sure, I'm sure Jeffrey Bauer must have seen this amazing, also very beautiful boiserie, and uh, they are well preserved and very much visited. Um, I visited early on, and somebody told me, oh, you should go and have a see, a look. And, uh, and I went quickly, and then I noticed that they have very beautiful walls, the walls that protect the garden from the outside world, but maybe also protect the people living there to go out. So this could be also the, the, the garden where place where people went to live there, made very luxurious house, but were not really allowed to travel so much anymore. And uh, I started to think about the role of the wall. What is the, a wall when the body cannot walk anymore? The mind can, and you start to imagine. So I started to see landscape in those walls. Maybe the landscape that the inhabitant of this place will not go anymore. And because I've been told that the garden very, very much part of a, an old Chinese tradition, which probably is hard for us to grasp because the notion of time is very different. It's not like talking about a Renaissance garden in Florence, which has one tradition, one way to, to make a garden. And then you have a palace in Versailles, also a very, time is much more fluid in China and you don't have very precise, you have dynasty with style, style is continuous. The most important thing is the inspiration. The inspiration comes from maybe a calligraphy and the calligraphy is a poem that talks maybe about a smell, a tree or an old painting. And what did I discover in front of this wall? A very spontaneous moss just growing that remind me the Chinese painting. And Somewhere it's a bit broken, so you know it puts you back in place immediately. You know you're there, you know you're now, and there's a bit of leaves moving. They just suddenly place back, and you have this shifting back and forth between what you imagine of a landscape that you are not seeing anymore, or has been inspiring this place many years ago, and something that you look at now. So here, a little bit more descriptive photograph where you see this landscape, in little pockets of moment of observation through the doors and through this uh, peeling off because the walls sometimes they peel off and they allow the light to come in. This is a light well, very, very nicely orchestrated and nature comes just to play with the wall because what is more beautiful than a, a branch or a tree growing in front of a wall because 
you have very pure design of the lines of the tree in front of something that is neutral but very imaginary, like the surface of the wall. So I went there also because they told me, oh, some of this wall in Chinese are called theater of shadows. Because in the past, I was very interested in, in shadows and space. And what is the role of shadow in space? I will talk a little bit more about this later on. But uh, when I arrived there, I thought, oh, God, what I'm doing? I'm bringing all my Mediterranean knowledge into this place. No, this is not about shadows. This is about humidity. A country which is so humid, where it's grow like Sri Lanka is growing as you breathe, and the humidity is droplet. It's just lots of droplets in the air, and it's somehow it's full of color. And I became more and more fascinated by the very delicate color of this moment, and how maybe the green suggests to life more than a grade that maybe make you thinking about decay. It's not decay, it's life coming into the walls. So it's the set of, I forgot if it's 20 or 24, black and white and color photograph uh, done uh, over very two trips that I've uh, organized and then exhibited there in China and then also, some of them came to the Royal Academy. And it was very beautiful that the Royal Academy to somehow finish the exhibition with such an abstract concept, which is what do you imagine when you have a wall in front of you? And uh, I'm sure what I saw and how I felt there and my observation, even if it's many years later, where uh, were there because I, I went to Lunuganga. Lunuganga was the changing point for me in my work to detach with these very obsessive details of shadows and to open up a bit to something vast and complex as nature and to see how it's going to weave in into the experience of architecture. And yes, color became more and more important. Delicate color, color that suggests air, growth, poetry. And sometimes they are there almost by mistake. Nobody has been planning those colors. It was a wonderful experience, I think, to just face walls and what happened from the walls. It was a very revealing for me moment there. And uh, yeah, uh, I like to carry on also in that direction. Here we're gonna look at them and want to give enough time to be able to talk about Lunuganga. So, but I was keen, very keen to share this moment of the Suju Garden uh, walls um, photograph and this completely imaginary place that I created with my photograph. So none, never this intention has been planned. I mean, I want to show you this photograph. I, I had a group of Chinese students looking at this photograph at the Royal Academy and they say, oh, Ellen, why you did photograph the window from the front? because we always represent window from the front. And I thought, oh my God, um, I'm not the build, I mean, in their organization of the garden, the window, those very special windows should be always from front. And I was saying, I'm not the space, I'm a photograph. You are not there, I have to give you something different. And this ambiguity of kind of looking at the little plant in the front and then entering to this very specific window. Notice that there will be another one round and playing with the tree back and forward and this other space that you notice the light is a bit more powerful. So, because I was outside, so you wondered why, why is it more light? I mean, all those moments are very important moments of the observation and to put something frontal will never be the same. So it is about recreating moments 
that are are taking you, yeah, taking you as possible, as close as possible of uh, the experience to be walking and dreaming in the garden. And then sometimes you plan, you visit, you plan everything, what time, where is the shadows, when. But then you have also this incredible moment of surprise. Then suddenly there was a reflection of three windows in front of a wall. And uh, I was almost packed, got ready to go, end of the day, we we're all tired. The guard was already closing. And I said to my sister, no, no way, no way. We put the camera back, we don't do it. We managed to set it up. And this image that uh, came out, it was absolutely adorable. That again, gives you an idea of dimension, you know, the light, sun somehow it's still there in a very playful way so i like to finish this series with this very playful image and one more important experience just one year after jp bawa the the work that i've done in janta manta um, the observatory in japu uh, you probably all know that place and what the Janta Manta mean. It's it's an observatory, but you 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 can read time and months on, but you can also read your future. And uh, it was for me an absolute must to go there because I was invited to photograph um, shadows in space for an exhibition uh, at the dam in Frankfurt. And first I photographed shadow inside La Tourette de Le Corbusier. So this is a monastery done by a master architect. And I just study how every space had different types of shadows to allow you to be a young priest, to learn, to have your normal life, to have a spiritual life. Um, what's the role of the shadow? And it was almost like after this, I can't photograph anything. But then I thought, no, I can go to, uh, to Jantamanta in Japur and photograph uh, shadows that are this tiny, tiny, tiny moment. Let's start with this, where a little, a little spot again in the world, it's telling you so much because it's a scientific object. And the human being has been calculating, making, writing, and shadow is an absence of energy, it's an absence of light. If we think that first it was darkness and then light, came, it's also something that connects you in space and time with some big dimension. You are connected, every time you're connected with darkness or shadow, you're really connected with big dimension. But on top of this, in this beautiful observatory, there is the science of the human behind that make you really understand the universe. Not only connect spiritually, but understand because you will know when is the next monsoon, when the rain are coming, when next month, what the time of the day. It's a fantastic place, absolutely inspiring for me as a photographer that is trying to find place where architecture, build environment, it's giving us dimension that place us on earth. So this observatory was like, yeah, was a huge present for me to do. And it become this kind of dance between the shadows, the building, the shadows of inside, which are just casually there like this, or the one that are made to create a moment of knowledge. You know the, stru the structure, they are big, they are small, they're full of people, they're full of life, they are really embracing the universe. There's this generous feeling of embracing the universe. And they were extremely inspiring for me to photograph. Now let's go to uh, my fantastic experience to be invited uh, by the trust and support by uh, the Agathan Foundation to photograph Lunuganga. We're talking at uh, quite a long time ago, and you realize that um, it was uh, 2001. And uh, as I say, I never photographed nature before. Um, and I arrived in the afternoon of a beautiful day. That was my first impression. And 
I was looking at this incredible light, the paddy field, the smell, I was hearing, hearing the ladies that go to the water to clean, to wash their clothes, the children playing. And I was observing the leaves and I thought, where I'm gonna start? How do you photograph? How do you photograph such a complete experience? as a piece of landscape so well orchestrated. And I called my friend Gary Dorothy. He's assistant professor at Harvard and he's very, it's his, most of his work is on the landscape and territory. And I said, Gary, what can I do? And he said, look for moods, look for moods. Don't try to understand everything. Look for different moods, different moments where you feel different things. And uh, I, next day, got ready and started to photograph and started to put together image where I felt connection and moods which were very different. You know, again, these pockets of dream that I mentioned before that are created, not anymore because of a building, not in, you know, because of a kind of close environment, but because of nature being so much in harmony, so much in dialogue, so much, you know, it's been constructed and it might change. It changed because it's growing. Jeffrey Bauer was still alive. He was not very well, but I heard he was still changing something. So it was something completely alive in the garden. And uh, what I discovered where this, this beautiful object, pots, little gazebo, positioned in the most delicate way. And I said, yes, this is again, the possibility of a place to make you feeling the immensity, the nature, the change, the growing, the harmony, but also making feeling the fragility and the instant. And those, those moments of object, they ground you. They ground you into the place. While you are flying of emotion, you are ground because you need those moments. that are so specific and so formally a bit different. And that was a fantastic experience for me to, um, to go through. To, to, to live. And sometimes they are plants, sometimes they are objects, but you always have a feeling that you are also grounded somewhere. You are connected with the, the place you are and not only confronted with vastness and immensity. But that gave me a sense of being that is uh, somehow something I always carry in my photograph. But here we have also a bit of architecture coming in. What of architecture? I mean, of course you are in a place that change all the time, you're in a garden. So a staircase cannot be a monolithic big structure to go up like you will have in a Renaissance building, but it is a dancing, changing, ambiguous place that you don't know where to put your step and you have to be alert. It is very organic. And I absolutely adore to photograph this place with different angles, different light, different moment, because it really gives me a sense of how any architecture um, intervention in the garden are also so organic and playful and give you the same sense of fluidity that you have when you are looking at the landscape. Then, the experience of being under a tree full of flowers. I mean, we all had this experience. It's the most uh, ravishing experience. It's the protection of this light shade that allowed the air to give you a bit of freshness. And um, so sometimes, like I say in the beginning, it cannot be one photograph that gives you the all. You have to create diptych. And this is for me a diptych where you, you are in between the leaves, but you are also completely immersed when you look at the ground and you have this projection of the leaves. 
So you have the space of the tree projected on the ground and you really feel that moment of what being there. Like we all know, it's not a flat landscape, you have little hills, and so you have very uh, big variation of the viewpoint where you can start to observe how the nature is changing, how the water is influencing the landscape, you imagine what could happen there. It's never a fixed flat land, it's full of surprise. Then, as you might have noticed, I use quite a bit of color. I use color because I, I was not in a season that was extremely full of flower, but it was of course very green. And the green, it's never the same green in the sense that every green, every tree is different, but also with the different time of the day, the green changed so much. Sometimes it's very blue and very mysterious. And sometimes it's a, a green which is more uh, screaming and full of life, like the uh, young leaves of the paddy field. So it became almost like a celebration of green color, which is a, actually it's a quite of a difficult color in photography. It's not something that is easy to represent. It, it absorbs a lot of light, so it's not easy. But I was very pleased to um, play with the sense of the variation of green that I encountered. And then uh, again, um, to see, I mean, I don't know why the, the pass was at that point finishing in such a good way. Is that because it was, it's been in the process of being restored or is it like this always? Or I don't, it doesn't matter, but it gives me a sense that the garden is full of surprise and it doesn't have this logic that often we have maybe in the Renaissance and in the Baroque garden where things are guiding you very precisely. It's also a place to, to get lost and to enter into your thoughts with not with rationality, but with emotion. Uh, I want to uh, just have a little moment tell about my experience of being there and meeting Jeffrey Bauer. He was still alive. He was not well. Nobody knew how much he understood from the world still or could communicate with the world. That he had a very dedicated nurse and gardener around him, taking around the garden. And um, I was extremely uh, honored to meet him. And I brought him a book. I brought him a book that I had done uh, early on. It's called The Inns of Court. It is a place where actually Jeffrey Bauer had his first education as a lawyer, which is a very beautiful place in London. There are a few areas in London. There are different inns where there's traditional building and beautiful gardens. And I keep thinking what it that must have had this place for him and maybe the love he had for these places that had influenced his desire to also start to study architecture and then do beautiful landscape. I mean, one of the photographs is this one. And uh, he touched the image with his finger and started to cry. So it was extremely emotional because he, mean, he remembered. We, the, the, the nurse said, we don't know, we don't know what, what he knows about the world, but he didn't know a lot because when he saw this picture, he started to cry and he probably had a feeling about his youth and being there as a young man studying and deciding what to do with his life because he studied law before to become an artist. So that was a fantastic, um, very revealing moment for me. Um, yeah, so after that, I carry on uh, photographing the garden and uh, looking for place, uh, place of rest. This that also give me a sense of the rituality of life, uh, how a garden like this allowed you maybe to have a life where we have, um, yeah, we have almost a 
pattern of activity, where do we eat, where do we rest, where do we read, how do we look at the world. And I think there it's absolutely fantastic to be able to have your daily routine surrounded by the nature and the architecture. They inspire you and tell you what to do. But then I also was introducing slowly the architecture into the project and the, the light and the relation with the outside and the inside and how soft those boundaries are. And the light was entering the room and touching around midday this wonderful little sculpture. And the gardener said, oh, my lady, it's time for lunch. And I said, how do you know? Because the sun is touching the ladies. I know it's time for lunch every time the light comes. And I said, oh, it's wonderful. This is this, this place. It's not only a place of inspiration, of grounding you, of giving you a sense of rituality, but it's also a big clock. And then I thought, oh, well, every moment of the month is going to be different. But no, because you are the equator. So the change of light is not like us, because we, we might have that situation, like in this photograph, for a couple of days, but then change because uh, of the position of the sun and the earth. But at the equator, the, the change are very small. So um, yeah, that was also a very beautiful moment to realize how the light and the way you perceive life in your daily life is different in every part of the world. And in Sri Lanka, you have a very specific rituality in relation to the light because the light and the shadows and the moment of shyness don't change so much in with this changing of season. They stay quite the same. And again, this relationship between the outside and inside, those boundaries are so fragile. And the moment you enter with this photograph of the ground, you still see the shadows of the outside and you, you're not confronted with something that wants to be a clear boundary. That's something that invites you to come to the shade, to come to sit, but not to be away from the garden, away from nature. And then this, uh, this wonderful little, I don't know how you call it specifically, but it is uh, a little pavilion, uh, which is for me like a memorial for Jeffrey Bauer, where um, he all can reflect on his life, beautiful um, sculpture, he can sit down, but also this, this leaves and the pattern that you see that the leaves are gone, that they left trails it's all about you know traces of life and traces of changes and traces how nature is still there and the, the spirits are still there and we are all there to, to perceive and to go through uh, the experience that is being given by this amazing man to uh, rest in a place which is so complex Again, before I finish, this duality between the, the instant and the eternity, the fragility and the immensity, it was really the guiding point of those photographs. You know, with a spark of light on a detail, three coconut tree that somehow give us like a poem when they are confronted with the sky, with the magnitude of our world. And we, with photography, we bring those different moments and our mind can kind of somehow flow from one detail to the next and play this role of, of creating a very specific moment that um, belongs to the place. Again, images of peaceful, uh, growth and the sense that the garden is never going to be the same, that is changing how you sleep, that is also functional. They are paddy fields, and you will get uh, the rice and you will get a wonderful meal at the end of the day, which is purely made of product from the estate. So, this beauty of uh, the production of the rice, it's there in front of you. And um, yeah, of course, it's. Uh, 
absolutely incredible dimension to the food that is produced from the place you are photographing. And to finish this last image, uh, which is actually the image of the little uh, where I was staying, it's the, with the courtyard. But why to finish with this image? It's, it's again to celebrate the, the architecture that makes an understanding nature. It is framing nature, letting nature to come in, letting nature to be part of it and uh, inviting you to this complex relationship and conversation about uh, us, the built environment and the more wild one. Um, this is a discussion that I, um, I hope to carry on and I hope to bring to an, an exhibition in, in, hopefully in, in, in October in France, where I will also bring some of this work and talk about uh, the importance of the relation, complex relationship between architecture and nature. So uh, with this, I'm finishing my talk, but I also want to have space for questions and yeah, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was really wonderful. It was amazing to I feel like we just traveled. Um, I I'm going to we we will open up for questions for from the audience and uh, I will encourage uh, all of you to drop your questions into the Q and A uh, chat box. Um, and while we feel those in, um, I was wondering, Ellen, if you go, if you ever go back to spaces and photograph them over time. I loved your um, description and sort of explorations of time in your work. Um, is it ever recursive? Um, I mean, ideally, a photographic essay. It's never only one visit. It's always two or three visits. Um, and it's enriching you and enriching the work, also because of the season, the light, the change, the realization that you you had in head in your head something. It's like the beginning of my photographic essay in China. I want to do shadows on these walls. And then after a while I said, no, stop it. This is you're bringing your your heritage from Italy there, it's not about shadows. So you, because you prepare yourself, you kind of create a scheme and then you have to be open to receive something different. And then sometimes this happens while you're shooting or it happens when you are printing. Uh, I print all my work, and it's all in analog. And then you, you want it to go again. But there's also a point where sometimes it's finished. You've done it. And uh, if you go back and back, it becomes almost a mannerism. I remember I, I went to photograph the Thermal Bar of Peter Zunt a few times. And then at one point I realized now I will be pushing for something which is not natural. The work is done. Maybe many years later, it could become something else. But there's a sense that at one point, um, yeah, you should not become some mannerist where you want to be a bit different, but you don't know why you're different. Um, I actually, I have a follow-up question. We have, I'll get to the next one that uh, has been shared. Um, I'm also curious about ruin and how, um, I think, you have an interest. I mean, I, I loved what you said about it not being, uh, when you were talking about the walls of Suzo, that it's not decay, but life. Um, but again, do you, do you look at ruins? Do you look at? Yes, it's very nice you're mentioning because at the moment, actually, I'm starting a work on ruins and I try to understand also the value of ruin and how can you uh, revisit ruin? Not only as a knowledge of the past, but about what, what energy and what role do they bring you now and uh, what your imagination can see in, in them. 
and uh, that's why I went back to photograph something in Rome and started to put together with some sculpture work. So it is something I'm definitely investigating. And uh, I mean, ruins are very powerful because there is all this stratification and the memory of what it was, but also they are different now. And uh, we play with those two dimensions. They're different now. They have different visual impact. They are full of layers and traces and changes. Still, we know what they were. And so our mind keep going back and forth, which is, uh, yeah, it's a very nice uh, device, let's say with photography to kind of make you thinking about what you see. And, uh, yeah. so, yes, I, I, I really enjoy ruin. And then there's always the organic aspect of them because nature might take over or surprise you or the seeds are growing. And uh, so there's something very organic also, it's just beautiful. Yeah, I mean, when you show the Utsuma photographs, it definitely made me think of Rome, and that, that was why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we are getting some questions. I'll, so the first one is from Felipe, who asks, uh, have you ever photographed in Portugal? In Portugal? No, I would love to. There's so many great architects in Portugal. So um, I went for a conference, but I never photographed. And I think... They have good architecture, but they're also good photographer. But yes, I'm sure I will be able to do something uh, in Portugal because it, I, from what I know, it's a country that I like very much. Um, we have another question from Madhushan who asks, uh, I want to know how you create a short list or game plan when you're at a location. Uh, is it as you go or do you pre-plan? That's a good question. Like I said before, I pre-plan. Uh, of course, there is a knowledge about the place. There is a knowledge about what the place means for me. And uh, this is one part of the brain that is prepares. But then when you go, it's important to spend time before making the photograph. So then you started to receive the impression of the place and what how do they make you feeling and um, put it together, but also you start to notice the light. And because we draw with light, um, it is so important and you have to know every space, what sort of light is gonna get you. And sometimes it's important to be in two rooms at the same moment. So you really need a bit of time to orchestrate that. And so the planning is important, but it's very important to be able to react to something that surprised you and was not in a plan. I mean, uh, some photographer, if you think about the Berkshire, they were photographing always frontal, gray weather, same lens, same camera, building of one category in Germany. It's not my nature. I could not fulfill a scheme. The scheme is there to protect me. And then if I see something that I like, I would go for it. Um, of course, what I like unconsciously is still part of this program. It's not that suddenly you become completely different, but you, you, need, you need organization. If not, it, it can be also quite, uh, I don't know, you get very agitated or should I be here or should I be there or no. Now I'm here, I'm in this place. It's, six o'clock in the morning, the light is good, I'm gonna do this. And then like a horse with protection, I would look at next things next day. If not, you, you can't get anywhere. I think that's actually a great segue for our next, we're getting so many questions. The next one is uh, from Marisa who says, can you speak to the question of photography as a slow medium? Did you ever find it insufficient to record change in time and wish to work in different medium like film? Um, I, if I have a wish to work in film, it was not because I had a frustration with photography. It was because I could be interested in the medium of film, which is different. I think, uh, if you encounter obstacle in any discipline, this is when the creativity kicks in. 
um, this is why I'm not so interested in digital because I think we have less obstacles, we have so many possibilities, so you're less creative. If you think about, I don't know, uh, the physical obstacle of making the sculpture of the Pietà by Michelangelo, how from a block of marble, he imagined that incredible sculpture. You've got to deal with some obstacle to create something. And this obstacle can be conceptual, time, space, but to make something, you have to be wonder about what to do. And uh, if I have a new interest, it's because maybe another world interested, but not because I think photography is not complex enough to deal with. Um, we, we have Nanika asking um, if the color images of Nunganga were analog uh, photo, whether they were Oh, yes, definitely. To Mazo One, it was, uh, and I'm still only uh, work on film, I work on transparency. So it's very beautiful. You have an object full of light and you can look at their life, you know. Um, you know, they're difficult to expose. You have to be very concentrated. Now they're very expensive. So every shot will point. Um, yeah, I'm still working that way. And that's what I did then, yes. And you mentioned that you, um, I'm piggybacking off Manika's question, but you mentioned that you also sometimes discover things in the process of the printing. Could you speak a little bit more about that? I mean, the, the shoot, yes, I'm slow and I organize myself, but there's always a pressure of time, of weather changing. Of, uh, so you work with the pressure. And uh, when I'm in my dark room and I print, I sometimes stand in front of my print for a long time to decide the contrast, to decide. And uh, there are some things that I discovered that were not planned. It could be how some tonality are more important, how it's not necessary to have a shadows, how is it maybe better to be more uh, specific or, you know, how to change, how to evolve in my language and uh, to be confronted with the slow process of printing. Um, yeah, for me, it's where I started to reflect. I mean, I'm sure you can do it in front of a screen too, but because you're obliged to spend those two minutes in the fix, in the water, in the dry, in the thing, there's a lots of very intimate moments where you are confronted with the work. Um, we have a question from Nile. Uh, um, Nile is from Pakistan, currently still learning architectural photography and wants to know what is your approach to creating the images as mentioned by you? As there's not always pockets, um, moments of observation available. What do I do when there's no nice little pockets of her? Uh... I mean, uh, as an artist, I choose subject where I feel I can bring something uh, that interests me. So it could be that they are not pocket of green, but a more radical statement. And um, I will be in front of a, of a place because I know I have something to say. Um, if I have nothing to say, I am not there. Uh, um, something that is part of uh, I've been 30 years in this profession, so I can forecast and decide to go or not to go somewhere. And, yeah. and maybe that's a, um, so we have Tiva asking, do you usually need to stay at a place? How long do you usually need to stay at a place to familiarize before you start shooting? And I'm, if I might add to that, um, sorry, Tiva, could you, I mean, you, uh, you mentioned a lot of writers on space, and um, I'd be curious, sort of, do those connections come to you when you're on site, um, when you're researching, when you're developing the film? 
I mean, the connection uh, with the writing mostly come from when I'm preparing a talk or when I'm making a book, uh, when I've been asked to choose an author to write the text for the book. And uh, while I try to go to lectures and to part of an university program and then I, I meet. So um, yeah, they are, they are author that, they are, they are very classic authors if you are interested in space and architecture, they, I think every student must know about this. But I will say that when I look for inspiration, I will, yes, spaces and analysis of space by different culture, but I will more look in maybe visual art or music. Uh, I don't get inspiration from photography directly because it's too conflictual. You have to, you have to keep, you have to keep your freshness. And I, I feel for the young people because sometimes it's so hard. You're so much uh, exposed to so many images now. Days when I was young, we didn't have that, so you could be in touch with yourself um, in a better way somehow. And, um, yeah, inspiration comes from a lot of different things. Sometimes from a walk, sometimes from a swim, sometimes from a book. Uh, and um, you never know exactly what you're looking at, but you prepare a range of things that you think, oh, maybe I think of something out of it. Um, one more from Madhuri who says, uh, while photographing, do you, and if so, how do you separate your interpretation from the architect's vision for the architecture? I, I think now I'm an author, so I make my story and uh, I build up something that is made on my reflection about what is photography, why do I use photography to talk about space? Why I'm interested? What is this places we talked about, you know, where they give us answer or they give us the feeling to understand ourselves. But I always use a bit, when I have this question, the, the metaphor of a musician with a score, I have a score and I respect the score when I play. Uh, I'm not going to mess up the score. Uh, I know it and I know it's from a specific period and it has some ideas and some of these ideas are definitely implementing and enriching me a lot. And then I play with them. Uh, but it's my song, it's my song. So. Um, and thank you. I, I don't know if you've been, able, I mean, if you've seen, um, Ellen, but there's been a lot of um, a lot of people just saying how inspiring this was, and I certainly also just really enjoyed um, going through all these places and um, images with you. So thank you very very much, um, and thank you to everyone who joined um, across many many time zones. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I know that you are all in different places. Yes, I think from many places. Um, and Ellen, thank you again. Uh, it's really amazing to see some of the other uh, photographs from what, as I said, very about 20 that were in the dam exhibition that I know uh, really well. It was amazing to see more of that, that, that body of work. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It was great fun to go back to this work and bring it alive and share it with young public good luck with everything thank you um and to um to all of you in sri lanka i hope you will come see the exhibition we are open until april 3rd and you can see um some jeffrey flowers photographs but also um more about more on this dialogue between drawing photographs by uh, Dominic Sansoni and Sebastian Pusingis, um film. And I think it is really just so wonderful to be able to dwell on um, image and, and the various roles that it has played in 
in the architecture. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye now. And thank you.